we're, we're in St. Louis, Missouri, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's we've got about 15 to 20 percent of our of our workforce working from home now, including manufacturing okay. and some other things. So we've kind of pared down our, our building to uh, the bare minimum. Uh, I'm in charge of our sales network, but also our customer service team. So I come yeah. in about 50 percent of the time to make sure our logistics and shipping and all the uh, incoming orders and how our team is working here internally. Uh, we've even separated our uh, production staff into multiple shifts and broke them up into uh, work groups uh, to further distance them as well to keep them wow. safe. Sounds like you got it under control. Um, so when you're going to and from your home, are you wearing a mask? What, what's the environment like well, out there? So, it's, so we have a, Missouri is a very strange place. So we have a, our, our governor put in a, um, a, a lift to the shelter in place order for May 4th. Uh, we have two major counties. We have St. Louis County on the East Coast and Kansas City on the West Coast. And both of those major cities and counties have instituted the stay in place until the Mar May 14th. So they they kind of are a little bit disconnected in terms of, of of what that means. But what you know, the big question here for most people is what does stay at home order really mean, right? Yeah. Essential businesses. We are considered an essential business. Um, obviously, we can come to work, but we've reduced our force, as I mentioned to you as well. But coming to and fro, um, I wear a mask in the office, eyeglasses in the office. Uh, when I yeah. leave, uh, I don't in my car, but if I go into a store, uh, I obviously do. Uh, it's really, you know, based on courtesy and me protecting others from me potentially having COVID or other symptoms alike. Um, I think it's just a good common practice to kind of help flatten the curve, so to speak. Right on. The big challenge for countries like U.S. and Brazil, where you have massive populations, is testing, right? So uh, for right. us, we've got just over 6 million people in our population, and I think something like 56,000 tests as of yesterday. So that yeah. amounts to, what, a little bit less than 1% of the population, roughly? So, you know, they're in Missouri again in the surrounding area. Uh, what's happening to the ophthalmology clinics um, from what you gather? Well, you've seen a lot of things, uh, elective surgery. So we, we operate in both anterior and posterior segment uh, procedures. Okay. Um, all of the elective surgeries have been, for this part, canceled. Um, yeah. So most of our anterior procedures, cataract procedures have, have pretty much dried up. Uh, in the state of Missouri, uh, most of our procedures are done in uh, ASCs. Uh, and so most of those that have been elective procedures have pretty much dried up uh, and are on kind of a wait and see basis. Posterior segment side, um, while the AAO has put, uh, and ASRS have put out guidelines of treatment, um, they are really for emergency procedures. And so we've seen a cutback of around to around 20% of the normal amount of procedures that are going on uh, for okay. retinal procedures. Um, yeah. In the next month, in May, uh, we believe um, that a lot of these um, elective procedures will be able to be uh, released and to be able to be performed again. And then it's yeah. going to be a situation of educating patients and patients feeling comfortable going into those clinics uh, to get treatments and surgeries. It's interesting because I always kind of considered the posterior segment a little bit less commercial um, than the anterior segment. But right now, maybe it's what's kind of keeping certain clinics afloat, um, you know, because of the, the necessity. Yeah, possibly. You have an interesting thing internationally. Uh, I know in a couple of uh, podcasts and web seminars that have gone on uh, in countries like Italy, uh, most of the ophthalmology cases, especially retina cases, are done in hospitals. And so yeah. they're, they're going to have a harder time convincing patients to come back into the hospital to be treated uh, after COVID and after things settle down. And I know they're dealing with that now as well. In terms of, of your business, uh, how are you guys faring now? And, and what's the plan during Corona? Well, I mean, everyone has a best laid plan, right? Until they get changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we uh, we are operating at full capacity. Um, we have uh, we've taken some proactive steps as a company to um, continue operating at full capacity, like I talked about, separating our work shifts and our our, our work cells. Um, we've even worked with a lot of our suppliers to ensure that they're able to continue to operate. Uh, at capacity as well. We've, we've bumped up our stock of components so that we can prepare for the opposite end of this COVID crisis and the inevitability of the backlog of procedures that will take place. 
Um, we've put so there some be a real spike in business after some amount of time. Well, you know, we want to be proactive uh, as a small company. I mean, we've got just under 120 employees. Uh, uh -huh. And so we, we have the capacity to be a little bit more proactive. We've implemented um, these procedures internally to kind of protect our staff, but also prepare them for uh, the positive side of what happens at the end of this. We want to be there for our customers and the surgeons and patients and have products available for them uh, when business, I guess, goes back to normal, if we want to call it that. I don't know yeah. what normal is going to be anymore. I think normal is going to change for a lot of people uh, and a yeah. lot of companies. And so we, we need to be as proactive as possible as we can to prepare for that and change with that. And that, that even speaks yeah. for how um, people in the industry work with surgeons and clinics alike. You know, that's going to change dramatically too in the months to come. I, I, I have a sneaking suspicion, don't know if it's right, but that perhaps the market would change to become a little less, um, emphasize a bit less on the premium segment for a while, just because really you gotta kind of get the basic surgeries going again. Sure. And if you're talking about the premium segment, it almost seems like kind of a luxury at a time when, you know, globally, um, the world may be still, still suffering. So I'm just wondering from a messaging standpoint whether ophthalmology may change a little bit in that regard in the near future. Yeah, poss possibly. Um, you know, internationally and domestically are kind of two separate segments. You know, we, you know, we manage them differently and uh, yeah. they are different. Uh, each country is its own special entity. Uh, the way procedures are done in France differ than they do in Spain, differ than they do in Italy, differ than they do in the United States. And so we have to kind of work with our commercial partners to enable them to react and, and proactively work with them in terms of that. But the way that treatment is done, I think, will remain. But I think you're right. The way that surgeons and patients alike handle um, what is the best treatment protocol will be interesting to see what happens in the months to come.